Hello, everybody. Welcome to um, day two of African American Heritage Festival. My name is Angel Johnston. I am a education specialist here at the Charlotte Museum of History. Um, thank you all so much for being here today. We have a whole week of programs scheduled that are 100% free. Um, thanks to our event sponsors, Pride Magazine and the Arts and Science Council. Um, today's program is with one of my favorite people, at Lakeitha Blakeney. Um, thank you for being here, Lakeitha. We're so glad to have you. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So um, let me introduce you and then we'll talk about what today's program is going to be. We're going to talk about sort of the connections between the past and the present. It's going to be a good time. So here we go. So Lakeitha is a playwright, actor, and director. I would also call you a historian. I don't know if you would call yourself that, but I would call you that. Ooh, um, yeah. <laughs> Lakeitha is a native of Concord, North Carolina. She received her bachelor's degree in theater and African-American studies from UNC Greensboro. She has her master's in English creative writing from Southern New Hampshire University. Before returning to North Carolina, Lakeitha worked with various theater companies in the US. She's currently working on a new script and a children's book that will be released in the fall. Her one woman show, which she performed in part at the museum in 2019 for uh, Connect with Culture Day, um, is titled Sweet Gin and is a culmination of your two loves, the history of black people and culture and the arts. So thank you again for having, for being with us. If we can get the slide down, please. Awesome, thank you. So today's program is formatted as a talk back, which is a theater concept, um, which you actually introduced me to in 2019 when you performed at the museum. And um, to me, and what I consider a talk back to be is a time after performance for the audience to respond to the program that they've just watched. And especially in the case of Sweet Jen, it's a great way to process those complex you know, ideas and, and the history and the feelings that come up about really tough subjects, like the ones you address in your programs. Um, I also love that you do these because your program, Sweet Gin, is based on real life women, enslaved women from across the South. And so it's a good opportunity for people to find out about that history. So um, today we're going to address the past and the present in a slightly different way. So let me bring up your program and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, great. All righty. I will turn it over to you. Take us through it. All right. Thank you so much, Angel. So yeah, I, I really enjoy talking about history. A lot of people that I know don't necessarily enjoy history, um, partly because there are some tough things in the past to discuss, like in the history of America, there are some things that are difficult to talk about. In the news today, we see the struggle with um, whether or not to add a critical race theory to the curriculum in high schools and things like that. I think we do our kids an injustice. I think they can handle uh, much more than we think they can. And they are very good at separating themselves from between from the past and the present. They understand that this was a particular group of people that my DNA might be connected to, but I did not do this thing. You know, they're, they're, they're really, really smart human beings, but the past is always with us. We never get rid of it. We can ignore it for a time, but I believe it's to our detriment. And I believe that we are our ancestors and there are things that are just passed down in our DNA. Like in my family, I was told that my great grandmother, whom I've never met, was a great speaker. And whenever she would speak to people or go to a place to speak that people really would listen. And then you have me, these generations later, making a career of performing and speaking. Um, some things just come naturally. Some things are just really and truly handed down to us. Um, so much of our past influences our future. Um, if you really 
study and research, you'll see how decisions that were made then affect now. So the choices that you make now will somehow impact your future and the future of others. So let's start by talking about one of my favorite things, food. Next slide, slide please. So um, I grew up, and maybe you two grew up, believing that there were certain foods that were just <clears throat> a part of the American diet. I mean, I don't remember a summer that was without watermelon or something like that. I don't know many Sunday meals without okra or black eyed peas and things like that. But these foods are not native to North America. These foods were actually brought to North America with enslaved people. Um, right now, Netflix has a show called High on the Hog. And... Um, Sorry, pardon me, here we go. Um, it's a show called High on the Hog and if you watch it, it's all about the food and how we are, how it connects us to our past. And um, I went to visit uh, a plantation in Charleston, South Carolina, the McLeod Plantation in particular, and the tour guide was amazing. And she talked about gumbo and the word Creole and how it's just a mix of different things. And a lot of times you might find an older person, an aunt, a grandparent who cooks and you want the recipe for a dish. I've done this a few times. I asked for a recipe for a dish, but there is no recipe for it. You just a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And honestly, you have to keep trying until it tastes like home. And that's what you had a lot of enslaved Africans doing, cooking meals and putting things together, seasoning together until it tastes like home. That thing that connected them to where they had come from. And so they could share that with generations to come. Um, next slide, please. So as you can see, yams are one of those things and certain types of rice are also one of those staples that were brought over. Um, these are just a, a few that we, again, have assumed that have always been a part of the American diet, but they were brought uh, with the enslaved people during the transatlantic slave trade. Now, I bet you're wondering how these abducted souls were able to bring a piece of home with them to wherever they were going. You know, and one of the fascinating ways they were able to bring it was in the hair. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And if you look at um, the American economy, especially when it comes to rice, that it actually, the cultivation of rice actually is what built a lot of the American wealth that we see today. They are the foundations that we stand on this very, very day. And I remember once watching my grandmother cook and I was asking her why she was doing a particular thing, a particular way. And she said, well, this is the way my mom showed me how to do it. And her mom showed her. And I'm sure that story went so on and so so forth, a little thing that was passed down. Of If any of you have ever seen the movie uh, Roots, the series Roots, um, the story of Alex Haley's family, just a uh, example of how things get passed down. Um, Alex, Haley's, Alex Haley's ancestor, Kuta Kinte, actually shared certain words, the search shared the language and the language got passed down to generation after generation. Of course, there was a, an adjustment in the pronunciation, but that is how Alex Haley was able to get all the way back to Africa to the exact village his ancestor had come from, from the few words that had been passed down by his great, 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 whatever grandfather. So things do get passed down. So the types of food we get, we eat are passed down in the same way. Now, again, so let's talk about how they were able to get these foods to the new world. Next slide, please. So it's all about the hair. So in this video, I'm just gonna talk over it because the young lady who's doing the braiding is actually speaking another language. She is, showing us how an enslaved woman would have smuggled something like rice or 
black eyed peas or some okra seeds in their hair. So I've seen several videos of this that will um, show you these examples. And this is how their children were able to bring it with them. Uh, if you ever get the opportunity to go to the African-American um, Heritage Museum in DC, the Smithsonian, um, there is an exhibit there where and much like in the same vein, trying to give a little piece of home to your child, there is an apron that this particular family was able to hold on to. And in the hem of the apron were seeds, um, leaves, and other things that would remind that child of her mother. So you can see how this young lady was putting the rice into the hair. So I can just imagine that happening, a mom just putting a little piece of home into her child's hair to help her remember. So this is why, one of the reasons why hair is such an important thing to me. I don't have a lot of it, but um, for me, hair are, is one of the few places where I feel like I have complete control most often. I can control what color it is, the length of it, the style, all of that sort of thing. And I have worn my hair naturally. like, And by natural, I mean I don't use any type of chemical in my hair because I had to learn how to embrace my hair and that how my hair grows out of my scalp is completely acceptable. Um, it's such a big part of our culture. You'll ask uh, any black woman, it is really and truly a shared experience about what wash day is like, about what swim day is like. My niece, the other day, my brother was trying to get her to go to the pool and she was like, no, I'd rather wait until after I get my hair braided because <laughs> it's a big deal. Like there are just, um, caring for our hair is a big deal. It's just a, a, another thing that connects us to our past. Um, so when a black person is asked to like alter his or her hair because the style is outside of societal norms, it is almost as if you're asking a person to erase part of themselves. It's like, that's how I feel. I feel as if you're asking me to erase part of my heritage. And unfortunately, um, Hair discrimination has been a common theme in America. Next slide, please. So these are just a few of the names of folks who have experienced. And this is, I mean, a fraction of the incidents. Um, the woman, there's a woman, Chastity Jones, lost her job offer because she refused to cut her locks. And the employer responded to her by saying, um, they just, they can get a little messy, even though she was very well like groomed and put together, he felt like they would get a little messy. But if he had known anything about the history of locks and how much meaning they have to a person, he may have thought twice. Um, Andrew Johnson, who also goes by Drew, was a forced to cut his locks during a wrestling match. You guys might've seen that. It made national news where on the sideline there's a coach just so easily just cutting his hair. And when I watched my, my heart just went out to him that there was nobody there to advocate for him, that that was completely unnecessary to just cut his hair in, in that form. And people with locks, and um, some people refer to them as dreadlocks, but there's a little bit of, of a difference between the two. But, um, they are a serious matter and they have a lot of meaning to them. So cutting them is not something that we do lightly. Um, the last name, Lamaya Cameron, her braids were cut as a punishment. She was seven year old playing with one of her braids in her hair and the teacher asked her to stop. And she didn't like a lot of seven year olds might. And um, as a punishment, the teacher cut it and threw it in the trash. And I just, could not believe it. And her mother, of course, was extremely upset, as you can imagine. But like I said, these are just a fraction of the black hair discrimination incidents that have happened in our country. You know, hair is a form of expression for anybody. It's not just for black people, just for anybody across the board. It's a form of expression. For me, it's a way to honor those that came before me. And 
hair really and truly has nothing to do with your professionalism or your intelligence or your ability to complete a task, you know, with so much going on in the world. Next slide, please. With so much going on in the world that we um, struggle with or can't control, like we have people who are homeless. There are people who are hungry. Hair is really, truly the least of our concerns. Um, it's a form of fashion and hair in a lot of ways can really be art. And these two styles are just um, a small exam example of that. Um, it's just more than these curls or these coils that are on the top of your, your head, you know? So um, I really feel like we should like not, let's not find problems where there aren't problems. Hair is just, it's just hair. And we should all be able to express ourselves however we see fit with our hair, you know, because in so many areas, we don't get to do that. Um, next slide. Just a moment. Sorry, my notes coming down. So these are two more examples of how hair can be art. If um, you've ever heard of the Bronner Brothers in Atlanta, they do a big hair show uh, every year and uh, it's pretty amazing. It's absolutely amazing the things that people can do, stylists can do with hair. The barber shop that I go to, um, my barber, he is amazing. His name is Cheek, by the way. Look him up if you need a haircut. He can really create an entire art installation on the side of a person's head. And he's such a good artist that he can also cut anyone's face into the side of your head. Like if you wanted a picture of your aunt or your grandmother, you just give it to him and he can make it happen. It'll take a while, but he really does some amazing work. So hair is absolutely art and let's just celebrate it. How about that? Next slide, please. An another connection to our past is our right to protest and our willingness to put our bodies in harm's way when we are seeking justice for all. Making our voices heard is absolutely, as you all know, not a new concept. I hear so often that uh, we don't wanna talk about the past when there is trauma there, but I truly believe that ignoring the past will not make anyone any less traumatized. You know, we have to learn from the past so that we can stop making the same mistakes. Next slide, please. In this short video, you're going to see some connections between the protest of the past and of the present. So let's take a look. He can tell us a lot about the protests happening across the country today. A professor at Old Dominion University is exploring the ways in which the calls for change today resemble those during the civil rights era. 13 News Now reporter Adriana Valba has the story. Across the country and throughout the world, calls for change following the death of George Floyd by police are still going strong after a week of protests. Dr. Narkita Sparkman Key is a professor of human services at Old Dominion University. She also researches vulnerable populations. Protests throughout our history have meant that the people are no longer willing to accept the things um, that that are, are really horrible in our country. She says the civil rights movement in the 60s says a lot about the calls for justice happening today. But the message is still the same as the civil rights era. They just want fair treatment for black people. Decades apart, there are striking similarities between protests during the civil rights movement and 2020. The similarity is that we're marching. If you look at pictures, from the civil rights movement, you see so many people, and it was not just black people out there marching, it's black people and white people and other nationalities coming together to say enough is enough. The protest nearly 60 years ago did lead to significant change. 
changes have come. You know, they did away with Jim Crow laws and, you know, people earned the right, women earned the right to vote. But some of the things that are ingrained in policies and procedures is going to take more time to change. But I do think that protests wake people up to see that the change is very much needed. With no sign of protests fading after a week, Dr. Sparkman Key says perhaps the issues uniting people extend far beyond what happened to George Floyd. Adriana de Alva, 13 News Now. So as you can see, the um, similarities between past and present. And one thing we can all remember that we have in common, no matter what, is our humanity. We are all human beings and we have to be able to see the humanity in ourselves so that we can recognize it in others. So we have to look at our past and see what it is that we are missing. Why are we seeing the same narrative come up over and over and over again? So let's take a look at the past and analyze it and study it and learn from it and do it a little differently the next time around. Next slide, please. So this is my favorite bird here. <laughs> this Sankofa is just my favorite like concept or theme. So Sankofa, I'll just read the slide even though I know you can. A word from the Akan people of Ghana. San meaning return, ko meaning go, fa meaning look, see, take. We must go back and reclaim our past so we can move forward so we understand why and how we came to be who we are today. This mythical bird's feet are firmly planted forward while his head faces the past. The Akan believe the past can serve as a guide for the future. And this is really and truly how I try to live my life each day. I try to remember the sacrifices that were made on my behalf. And every day I remember I have the privilege of doing this thing that my grandmother couldn't do or my great grandmother or my great great grandmother, everything they did, how they fought and survived it was so that I could have the privilege to live the way that I do now. And if I don't live every moment to the fullest that I feel like I do them an injustice. So I'm constantly seeking guidance from the ancestors. I've started to learn a more about um, ancestral ancestral altar, altars and things like that so that I can really have a place where I can sit and meditate and remember and be grateful for the things that they gave me and I hope you will too so I know this time we do a bit of a talk back so I'll um, ask Angel to come back on and facilitate that <laughs> awesome thank you so much Lakitha um, that I mean we sort of went over this in our in our uh, test run, but it. I think I could just stay here and listen for like however long you want to talk for. <laughs> I'm so nervous because this is different than doing a play. It so is. It I'm is. I'm not a character, so it was, I was really nervous. So well, thank <laughs> you so much. I um, one of the things that I was really struck by is the Sankofa word, and and at the museum, our mission is to preserve the past to inspire the future mm -hmm. um, and, and inspire dialogue to create a better future. Um, and that's, it's this, you know, there's like an alignment there. And I think absolutely for us, you know, that's why this event is important and why, you know, we want to learn about history. Um, it's not for history's sake. It's for, so that we can learn from it and, and, you know, go forth and be better. Um, so I, I do want to remind folks, if you're watching, um, if you have any questions for Lakitha, um, please put those in the chat. We'd love to talk about whatever um, this program has brought up for you. We talked about a lot of different things. So um, go ahead and type those in and we will try to get through them. Um, but I did, you know, Lakitha, I do want to ask you about um, your experience learning about all of these different things, learning about how food or, you know, and seeds were smuggled to wherever um, and, and learning about, 
you know, the importance of different hairstyles and things like that. How did you learn about that kind of stuff? Was it through your family? Yeah, honestly, I stumbled on the information. Um, The fun part is, too, I get to teach and share things with my family as well. Um, My brother's like, oh, what? A lot of times because he's not the biggest history fan out there, though. But there are a lot of things um, you can find some appreciation for. And it was just really in reading that I stumbled upon this sort of uh, this idea, like, because you would think, like, you you had nothing when you were taking. Um, a lot of people weren't wearing, didn't have clothes. There were no pockets. They didn't have, like, uh, they weren't able to go pack a bag before they were leaving. So how would you have gotten that? Like, you would have maybe on this this walk, this trek that you have to take, pass by some of the crops that you're family has planted. And I could see in my mind's eyes, somebody just grabbing a piece of okra to take it with them. Like whatever you could take that was home, that makes you feel better. I remember when I moved to St. Louis and uh, I was so homesick. (laughs) Oh, Angel, I was so so homesick. I was so pitiful. Um, And I was very nostalgic for my Southern cuisine and food, anything. And I probably, I don't know, gained, I don't know how many pounds in my first like couple of months there because I made my way to Krispy Kreme because no matter where you go in the world, Krispy Kreme tastes like Krispy Kreme. Um, And it just kind of reminded me of being at home. And and plus like the Krispy Kremes in St. Louis are like few and far between. It's not like everywhere, like I'm here all over the place. Um, So I was like, I found a Krispy Kreme donut. I'm going to go get a donut and I would feel better because it would remind me of being at home. It would be there. Um, I also have um, uh, another thing like in these strawberry custard like pies and it's because my grandmother passed away and that was one of the few recipes she did not leave behind. And my aunt had like 10 pies on the table because she was trying to, she was cooking from memory. And she kept cooking until she got the right flavor. And she said, come here, Lakeitha, taste this. And I was like, oh, I think that's it. And she was like, yeah, that's pretty close, isn't it? So I don't know if it's exact, but the pie that she has now is pretty close to what what my grandmother used to make. Because I had never seen that pie anywhere else. You know, so everybody has that. Each and every one of us, no matter what your like cultural background is, has that historical thing that gets passed down. You might not even realize it. You say it's probably that thing that just always has been. Like, just go ask a question about it and see, like, who did we get this story from? Who passed down this recipe? Or where did this come from? Where did that come from? And you could probably learn a great deal about your family history that way. Yeah, that's such a good point to, you know, go and ask your family members about your history. Um, Both my grandparents just recently passed away. And so, you know, I feel like, that loss. And, you know, you're talking about food. My grandmother used to make like, they canned green beans and like, you can't get that taste unless you have home canned green beans or like mm-hmm. my grandma made a pound cake and like, I like can't replicate that pound cake. I've made so many fallen pound cakes. Um, you have to keep doing it though till you get, <laughs> till it's it tastes expensive. like home. It's a lot of butter. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, going and asking your family about those things and, And I think one of the things that I love to see is that when you, um, when you go and talk about these things and then you also, you know, go read a book about, or you go watch High on the Hog and you learn about the food, you can sometimes make those connections between, you know, why does my family make this food? And then you go learn about that. And then that makes it really personal too, because I think one of the one of the big things maybe for your brother, who's not so interested in history, finding those personal connections is really mm-hmm. what draws people in. So, um, oh, Lisa says she's asking about food now, asking her family about food. That's great. That Good, Lisa. I, I, you know, I love when families have like family cookbooks and all kinds of things like that, or you go find like 
the church cookbook that has everybody's recipes in them. Yep. Those are fantastic. Um, yep. I have those things and I hold on to them. Like I don't cook as much as I would like to. And it's just purely out of like laziness. I just don't feel like <laughs> um, uh, it's just so easy just to stop yeah. somewhere, grab something and you're done. But yeah. um, I have made a vow this year in 2021 that I will cook more often and I'm going to try things that I haven't tried before that seem difficult um my aunt's chili like i'm gonna try it again it was so hard and it did not taste good at all the oh, first time I made it. <laughs> she just doesn't have a recipe she just does it she just is in her it's in her dna it's just the way she moves like it's muscle memory she knows exactly what to do um a few thanksgivings ago like i wanted to do the turkey we the younger generation was trying to take over well, not take over. We just like, we want you guys to pass the baton. We want to we wanna do the food this time around. But um, no, like as long as they have the ability to move, my aunt was like, well, yeah, you can do the turkey with me. <laughs> in my brain, I thought all I was going to do was, I don't know, like, you know, season base or whatever you do to turkey and stick the turkey in the oven. No. I found out that in there. you are also required. You are also responsible for the dressing and you are also responsible for chicken and noodles as well. I was like, uh, what? Um, she does not buy pre-cut vegetables because she feels like um, they lose flavor once you yeah. cut them. Yeah. Um, she uh, showed me the celery and I had never had anybody tell me to take the strings off the celery, how she pulls the strings off. So I had to do that and they have to be chopped in a certain type of way. Like I was exhausted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was exhausted. So we did all of that like prepping. And then the next day, I think I got up at eight o'clock that morning, which I felt was early. I agree. He was waiting for me at the bottom of the stairs. She was like, oh, I was just about to come get you. I let you sleep in. Yeah. <laughs> she said, I let you sleep in. Yeah. So there was so many different steps that she does. I had no idea all the things she does. But that is another way she shows love. Yeah. Exactly. The effort that she puts into her food is very much how she shows yeah. that she loves you as well. So I think I, I learned a lot today. Mm -hmm. Thanksgiving to me, like when we are interpreting at the museum and we talk about the kitchen and we talk about the enslaved woman who's the cook and we try to explain to people what the experience of cooking as an enslaved woman for 12, you know, of the, uh, you know, enslavers family and then also mm -hmm. other enslaved people who are living there. It's, it's like making a Thanksgiving meal every day. And, you know, you slept until eight and, you know, your aunt or wh whomever got up at like 6 a.m. or before the sun came up. Oh, before so that, yeah, she was definitely up before the chickens. That yeah, so that she could make that. And I think that experience is what a lot of enslaved women went through. I mean, not not drawing like a big connection, but just the- But not willing to, but yes. Being up and cooking all day long and making these elaborate meals for not your family, that yeah. your family wouldn't eat as well. But one thing about um, the enslaved cook, too, she did like she might have um, taken rolls in the folds of her dress or a little sack of flour. She would have done well. And enslaved folks had to learn how to season foods because there are foods that are popular today that we um uh, didn't realize were considered cast offs and were thrown wings. and given to you say wings. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Chicken wings were something that was given to enslaved people because they was not considered good enough for the, um, the master's family. Now everybody eats a chicken wing. I don't know anybody who doesn't eat chicken wings. And at the, the, during the Super Bowl, they said there's, you could put like wings from like end to end and there's enough wings eaten during the Super Bowl to like go around the earth or something like that. Like that, just a ton of wings get eaten. Um, something that I still don't eat, which is uh, chitlins. I do not eat that. I'm not a fan of that. But that is also something that was just given to enslaved people. And through seasoning um, is how we learn to make these things um, a delicacy. And now they are the popular, they're sold in the store. And in the store, they're called chitterlings. Like they have a whole like 
like all these extra syllables in the name <laughs> now, like they're a, um, a delicacy. They're just so yeah. many areas of everyday life where you can really and truly find the past because yeah. it is always with us. The past is not this dead thing. It is living and it is breathing and it is always with us. So I say resistance is futile. So <laughs> We might as well go ahead and embrace it and see what we can learn from it. It's showing up in our clothes. Um, there is a fashion designer whose uh, clothes are actually at Target right now. Uh, and I forget his name, but his inspiration for his designs comes from the church mother, like the, the hat, the crown. Okay. So his concept for his dresses come from that hat, that oh, style. Like big, poofy. Like, yeah, like, everything's yeah, big. Yeah. So it's really different than anything you've ever seen at Target before, but he says that's where he gets his inspiration from. So you'll see that and a lot of new designers will find like things from the past to put in and, and view. And now, you know, people wear corsets as a fashion statement these days when then it was, <laughs> it wasn't necessarily about fashion. That, that's your undergarments. So that's your support right. wear. So now they come in all like form, shapes, sizes, colors, everything. So the past is a way of just showing up. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about, obviously, you know, you seek out this knowledge and you go to museums and you watch, you know, shows on TV and stuff, but you know, what are some of the, where, if someone asks you, where do I learn about this stuff? So, you know, how do I find out what the past was like so that I can find, uh, you know, uh, re examples of it in the future? Um, where would you tell people to go? To well, learn about these things? it's it's so easy because, you know, we definitely in the age of the Internet, you know, Google is everywhere and you can find YouTube. You can find just about anything on there. Um, the Charlotte Museum of History is an excellent resource. You know, if you have not been there, it was um, when I stumbled and saw a sign. That's how I found I was just driving because I worked at Imaginon and I saw it off the highway. I was like, there's a history museum. Mm -hmm. And Charlotte, I had no idea. And eventually I made my way there and I'm like, oh, I like it here. And then it's just just uh, show you how small the world is, like a place where I worked, which is Matthew's Playhouse, happened to be doing this thing. And our paths kind of just crossed. Mm -hmm. And this is how this kind of relationship developed. Um, it's a beautiful space. So if you've never had the opportunity to visit, go visit. Yes. Take your kids, take your family, take your cousin, take your boyfriends and girlfriends and go visit. Um, the library, because I'm also a librarian, was another place because um, I read a lot um, uh, at the library. <laughs> Do you have any particular book recommendations? Um, High on the Hog is actually a book and oh. now Netflix has it as a series. So it started as a book first. Um, and I didn't know that, but I grabbed the book. I ordered it when I found it was um, a series. Um, gosh, I should have had a list of these ready. Now, now they've like all left my brain. Um, but just about anything you want to know about, even if you're not exactly sure, just do a, a, a quick Google search and things will come up. Like, you know, you want the history of fashion and like style. Um, there's like the big uh, bonnet gate that's happening right now with uh, black women in their bonnets and the debate on if your bonnet should be worn inside, uh, on, inside the house only. So if you don't know, like a bonnet is something, you know, you put on to protect your hairstyle when you go to okay. bed at night and um, you're taught, we're taught not, you know, you take that off before you leave the house. Um, I'm a little bit more liberal these days simply because I feel like the idea that uh, a black person or a black woman in particular has to be on point 24 hours a day, seven days a week is a concept that is steeped in white supremacy, um, that you don't get a moment to relax, that you have to look a certain way, you have to be a certain way so that they see you a certain way and don't think a certain thing about you. But I feel like if you're just jumping up to run to the grocery store, go. Uh, the picture that kind of started the debate was, were like four or five women, black women standing in the airport and they all had bonnets on. Well, first it was, the picture was taken without their permission. Yeah. Second, I don't know how long their flight was. 
And third, I know those bonnets were protective vacation hair. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not going to waste vacation hair on, on the airport. plane, yeah. <laughs> the airport, on the plane. I'm going to protect this dude because yeah. you don't know how long they had to sit. Were they on an international flight? I have no idea. Yeah. Um, and, and then too, also I've learned the beauty of minding my own business. I think it's a very um, a wonderful skill that everybody should learn. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody when it comes to like simple things like that. So, um, I, I just like, that, can you tell us a little bit about the research that you did to put together the sweet Jen character? Cause I think yes. that, you know, how you did that and then created that character, I think is a really good way of not like, I mean, cause you went right to the source um, to slave narratives from formerly enslaved people. And, right. and that's how you did that. And so tell us about that process. And, and if you remember which ones you read, um, cause I think reading the words of the people who experienced that part of history is the best way to learn about what it was like. Absolutely. Um, a lot of the narratives that I, uh, I read came from the library of Congress. They have a whole like, section there that is devoted just to uh, the slave narratives. Um, um, there's another book, I think Missouri Slaves, and it was all about um, enslaved people in Missouri. And I, uh, I read that book, just, just several, most of them came from the Library of Congress. Um, and I spent two years reading those narratives, partly because the language is a little difficult because you're trying to figure out what exactly they are saying and then the subject I think, matter i think it's important <laughs> to remember that those were written for a white audience um yeah and so sometimes it's not as clear as it may be because they were writing for a white audience and then with the wpa slave narratives those are written by white people who are listening to right an elderly black person um and so that's why right. so you, you're yeah. trying to like filter through. Um, it's like if a, a kid is introduced to Shakespeare, they might not always understand exactly what they're saying. And it takes you a few reads to really understand what is happening here. Um, so and the subject matter was a little heavy, so I would have to step away. I took several trips to Charleston and visit the old slave mark. Um, a museum, which is such an awesome museum there. Um, I visited, again, the McLeod Plantation, Drayton Hall. Um, I went to um, New Orleans and went to the Whitney um, Plantation there as well. They give a wonderful in-depth uh, tour and discussion of what life may have been like. And um, even at um, the Charlotte Museum of History, they uh the cookhouse um tell me her name again bet it's because you you even actually know her name yeah. and that she was there that's huge when you're saying like this person this is her name and she worked in this space and she walked these grounds to even know that information there is the lotta plantation um also in what is it it's not Con is, it, is it charlotte is it harrisburg they're in Huntersville. Huntersville, Huntersville, yeah. yes. The the lot of plantation there. Um, they actually have ads for runaways there, and you get a lot of information for a couple of runaways. But you get a lot of information about a person when they run away. You know what they looked like, what their age was. Did they have a scar? Are they young? Are they old? Is this their first attempt? To all this, you learn so much information from uh, a run a runaway ad in the paper. Um, so I use all those types of resources. In addition to it, um, I always like to pay homage to my family and include things in any kind of story that I tell. Um, so the one of the characters' name is in my play is Lucy, the young girl, but she's named for my fourth great grandmother who was enslaved in South Carolina. So, um, well, I believe she was like, I mean, born in 1846. So I'm just going to make the assumption that she was until I find out other, otherwise. But I named a character for her. And there are other um, people that I discuss in the, the script 
that I name for other family members because I just really like to stay connected and I like to have them with me. The music that I sing is from that era uh, as well. And our some song, one song is a song that's been passed down in my family. So uh, it is included in the play as well. I have um, a children's book um, that'll be out um, in December. And the names of some of those kids are my family members um, who have passed who have passed away. They have those same names because I just really want to honor them in everything I do because I do believe the gift of like performance and writing that I got it from my ancestors. I got it from them. Like it didn't just start with me. It started somewhere else. I love that. I love that a lot. Um, and thank you for mentioning your children's book. Um, I, we are running up on time. So I want to sort of transition to the end. So I'm going to ask you a big question. And then okay. when you're finished with that, I would love for you to share information about how people can find out what you're doing, um, find out when your children's book comes out um, and all that stuff. So we've spoken a lot sort of to this point already, but yeah. You know, if you if somebody asked you, why do I need to learn this? What would you tell them? Um, I would simply say, if not for these folks, you would not exist. Like if they were not here, if they chose not to survive, like if Lucy had chose to not survive or to take her own life while she was enslaved. I mean, really, who could blame her? But had she done that? I really would not be here. Um, it influences everything you do. The music that you listen to, like you think you have no connect, rap has no connection to scat or bebop or anything like that. It there it comes from someplace else. Um, a lot of people don't know that a banjo is an African instrument and that's how it got here. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's just so, there's so many little things that in your life, in your everyday use that would not exist had it not been for the people that had come before you, you know, and it's just um, a, I mean, it's just to say that I understand and I, and I respect that. I'm not saying you have to become a historian, but you never know. You might really get totally into it. Like that, that is the risk to run that you'll totally like fall down the rabbit hole and just fall in love with learning about where you're from. And it'll absolutely give you better insight to who you are now and the person that you would like to be in the future. So that's what I would say. Learning about your past and the past of your um, ancestors will give you great insight to who you are now and the person that you would like to be. So that's what that's I love. fantastic. Um, and how can people keep in touch with you um, and find out what you're doing and support you in your, you know, directing, acting, all that kind of stuff? Okay. You can follow me on Instagram um, at she can act one. She can act in the number one. Um, you can find me on Instagram and I'll post a lot of things there. You can find me on Facebook, Lakeitha Blakeney on Facebook. Um, send me a friend request and I will post things there. Um, I won't give you my website just yet because I'm in the middle of a rebranding and we're going to change a bunch of stuff. So you might not even be able to get there if I give it to you. Okay. <laughs> now. Well, when you, when, when that process is done, we will absolutely share it through the museum channels and, and all that stuff. But awesome. Um, I am definitely going to find you on Instagram um, and tag you in this. So um, thank you so much for chatting with us. Yes. I, thank you so much for having me. It was a blast. I really like, you know, we could talk about this forever. And so um, I do want to remind folks that African American Heritage Festival is continuing through the week. Um, I, we do have an update about tomorrow's program with Anthony Fox. Um, unfortunately, that program is going to be rescheduled for July. Um, but Anthony Fox, former Charlotte mayor and uh, transportation secretary, will be joining us. Um, it'll just be in July instead of tomorrow. Um, on Saturday, we are opening the museum. So you can follow Lakeitha's recommendation and come see us. Please um, do. It, it is free, but registration is required um, just to keep our numbers low, just to make sure that we are still being safe. Um, 
on Saturday, we have a whole bunch of stuff going on. Um, Dontavius Williams is a fantastic historic interpreter who's going to be performing his, um, I guess, Lakeitha, you do a one woman show. He does a one man show, um, The Chronicles of Adam. And he is fantastic. Um, he talks a lot about food and about um, art and all sorts of different things that are passed down in this time of enslavement um, and that survive through that time period. Um, we are also opening a brand new exhibit about the historic Salome School. Um, and we'll have the home site open, we'll be doing cooking demonstrations, and we're doing a uh, art series called Path of Portraits, where we um, have worked with some local artists to reimagine notable Charlotte figures. Um, and so they will be on site live painting them on Saturday, and you can talk to them about what they're doing and the people that they are painting. Um, you can go to charlottemuseum.org slash events to find the full schedule and to register. Um, last I checked, there were still spots available at 12, 1, and 3 p.m. Um, you just register to get there at that time, and then you can stay for as long as you want. Um, the program is 100% free, thanks to Pride Magazine and the Arts and Science Council who have funded this program and today's program and all these things throughout the week. So we're really grateful for their support. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope that you will get in touch with Lakitha and keep in touch with the museum. Uh, we will see you all. If not tomorrow, we will see you on Friday and or we will see you on Saturday. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye.